Prevence Explained. Hello and welcome to Prevence Explained, where we review and comment on legal events in the business world today. Just a few words regarding our firm and founder. Prevence Legal is a law firm headquartered in the Baltics and our founder, Edgaras, is a practicing attorney also in the Baltics, trained at King's College in London and now specialized in mergers and acquisitions and competition law. As for me, my name is Daniel. I was trained in Bonn and Maastricht and I'm very happy that you're here with us today. Let's talk about competition law. Today is the very first episode of The Prevence Explained in uh, English, and uh, we'll be talking about the topic of whether children should pay for their parents' sins from a competition law perspective. Uh, why are we talking about this topic today? It's because recently, to be precise, on the 6th October 2021, in the case Sumal versus Mercedes Spain, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Justice, the ECJ, ruled in favor of the idea that the economic unity concept is to be applied not only bottom up in regard to group liability, so basically parent companies are liable for the misconduct of the subsidiaries, but also top down. So basically subsidiaries are liable for their parent companies. Now the classical concept we all know that would be the uh, that would be the bottom up parent companies are liable for the misconduct of the subsidiaries. Uh, the other way around is something quite new, actually. Now, this is only applicable to civil antitrust cases, of course, specifically when it comes to proceedings revol revolving around damage claims, as it was here in Sumal versus Mercedes. Uh, maybe just a quick refresher, um, the economic unity principle. Uh, this means that a legal entity or legal entities can be held accountable for an infringement committed by another undertaking, by a separate legal entity. This, of course, this would require that the entities constitute a uniform organization of personal, tangible and intangible resources and that this organization permanently pursues a specific purpose. Now, apart from these factors, there must also be an evident connection between the economic activity of the subsidiary and the object of the established infringement. <clears throat> uh, what the ECJ did here in this case is largely follow the opinion of uh, Advocate General Giovanni Pietruzzella. Uh, the ECJ is positioning itself in a way that they're saying, yes, in cross-border situations, cartel victims can, under conditions defined by us, defined by the ECJ, not only take uh, action against the cartel members themselves, but against their subsidiaries. Now, this is a landmark decision, definitely, and it will significantly expand uh, previous case law in the area of economic entity liability and will definitely have far-reaching consequences for all sectors of, for all sectors of the economy. Uh, we can't really say how far yet, and of course, a lot of questions are still, will still remain open. Uh, we will discuss this a little bit later on, but first, let's get into the case facts. The Spanish container manufacturer Sumal SL sued Mercedes-Benz Trucks España, a Spanish subsidiary for the German Daimler AG for damages. Now, during the proceedings, Sumal leaned heavily on a 2.93 billion euro fine imposed by the European Commission um, on a truck cartel back in 2016 for price fixing. The Daimler AG, so the parent company, uh, was then a part of said cartel at the time. Now, the case was dismissed as inadmissible by the court of first instance on the grounds that Mercedes Spain could not be the debtor of the claim for damages because they lacked passive legitimacy. Now, the reason given was that it was not Mercedes that had committed the cartel infringement under Article 101 TFEU, but Daimler as the parent company of the group. So, Merce I'm, I'm sorry, wait, correction, Mercedes Spain had not committed the cartel infringement, but Daimler AG, the German parent company. Okay. Um, the Mercedes, this means that, of course, Mercedes Spain was the wrong addressee. So, the thing is, uh, Spanish courts have a history of divergent rulings on the, on the question of passive legitimacy. That is why the case... This particular case was later referred to the ECJ by the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal asking for a preliminary ruling on the question as to whether the subsidiaries are liable for the cartel infringement of the parent company in so-called follow-on actions. Maybe just for clarification, uh, follow-on actions or piggyback claims is basically where regulators find that companies have illegally engaged in anti-competitive practices or have abused their dominance. Um, there are parties who believe, when they believe they have suffered as a result of those actions, can sue either before the courts um, or the Competition Appeals Tribunal. And in that action, in that particular action, uh, the unlawful behavior is taken as a given. They don't have to reprove the anti-competitive behavior. This means that the proceedings can jump straight to the question of whether the behavior caused a loss 
to uh, to the client to the claimant and if so how much okay that concludes our little detour on follow on actions back to the case um what happened here now according to the ECJ in the event of a violation of the prohibition of cartels under article 101 TFEU cartel victims may not only direct their claims against the parent company that has been fined but also against the subsidiary even if it is not the addressee of the fine it is sufficient that the parent company and the subsidiary form an economic unit okay but if we now think about what happens to the subsidiaries what are they able to do in that situation of course they're able to defend themselves the court the ECJ also emphasized that the subsidiaries must be given the platform to defend themselves legally against these claims and show that they do not belong to the same economic unit as the parent company. Also, they are able to contest the infringement itself, but that is only the case if the infringement is not established by a decision imposing a fine. Only in that case are the subsidiaries entitled to contest the infringement. Apart from that, it also has to be backed by national law, so the ECJ also ruled that national law must ensure that the subsidiary can be liable for the parent company. Moving on to the next question, the why. Why did the ECJ decide to move into this direction? Um, as we're used to it from the ECJ, of course, they, they're backing up their decision with very strong reasoning. They say here that uh, the implementation of EU antitrust relies heavily on two factors. For one, it relies on the implementation uh, and the execution by public enforcement. So basically the regulators and everybody that work with the regulators, uh, the antitrust watchdogs, uh, but of course also on the private enforcement in the form of companies that are suing for damages on the grounds of EU antitrust law infringement. So basically exactly what is happening here. The uh, the company Sumal going after Mercedes Spain and then, of course, indirectly going after the big mothership, the Daimler AG in Germany. Now, um, the ECJ says the reasoning is that it follows from this that the term undertaking within the meaning of Article 101 TFEU cannot have a different meaning. First, when it comes to watchdogs that are slapping fines, you know, on cartel companies. But then when it comes to claims, private claims for damages for cartel infringements, the term undertaking has a different meaning. They say that can't be the case. So in the spirit of consolidated EU case law, the term undertaking must mean within the meaning of Article 101 TFEU is to be understood as any entity engaged in an economic activity, regardless of its legal form and the way in which it is financed. Uh, the ECJ also emphasizes here that this is not a matter of attributing fault to a third party, but rather recognition of one's own fault um, of the economic unit itself. Okay, circling back to what I just said a couple of moments ago and um, also our personal um, opinion on the matter. Now, it is extremely important that institutions with a lot of weight behind them, like the ECJ, deliver judgments such as these, you know, judgments that enable companies like Sumal to further their options when it comes to, to damage claims. Because at the end of the day, what does a judgment like this do? It levels the playing field for, for all actors. It makes it easier for Sumal to get reimbursed. And what it also does, it acts, it acts as a deterrent for parent companies because now the parent companies know that the actions they do, uh, the potential claimants that may arise from these actions, they, can't, they don't even need to go necessarily only after the parent company, but they can also go after their subsidiaries, right? So all in all, yes, it's a positive judgment. But of course, we also have to keep in mind that the judgments of the ECJ, they're not infallible. And we have to think about what might happen in the wake of this decision. Um, the question that arises here, of course, what happens in different situations? For example, let's say you have one parent company and three subsidiaries, right? So now you have subsidiary is liable for parent company. But what happens if you have one parent company and three subsidiaries? Is subsidiary one also liable for subsidiary three? If you want to be consequent, you say, well, if they form an economic unit, yes, absolutely. The question is, is that still fair? Depends on the case, you'd have to see. Another question, of course, is what happens if you have a parent company uh, and a subsidiary, they form an economic unity, but the parent company does not own the subsidiary 100%. What if they're silent investors? Isn't that a big financial risk for them? And how can they defend themselves legally if something would happen in that case? Right. Those are all really important questions that need to be asked, need to be discussed. <clears throat> But uh, nonetheless, we can conclude this podcast by saying, yes, this landmark decision is a very important decision. 
uh, opens a lot of gateways, a lot of positive gateways, um, throws up a lot of questions as well. But in general, it's also a nice example of how the ECJ believes that EU antitrust law can only work most effectively when private enforcement and public enforcement work together and especially have the same understanding, the same interpretation when it comes to um, the TFEU, specifically the, the term undertaking within the meaning of Article 101 TFEU. And with that, I would like to conclude this podcast on the elemental question if children should pay for their parents' sin, at least in competition law. Um, if you have any questions, any feedback, please don't hesitate to contact us over email or chat or whatever. And um, thanks for listening. See you next time. Prevents Explained